name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts be in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Spread the effect of the grace of thy flame of love over all humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Spread the effect of grace of thy flame of love over all humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Spread the effect of grace of thy flame of love over all humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, welcome to Flame of Love Group to St. Anne Barlett and St. Faustina Shrine. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jay Hastings, custodian of the first class relic of St. Faustina and founder of St. Faustina Shrine and Society. Okay, with that being said, I have an introduction to make. Let me introduce a lady I have come to know and respect in the last couple of weeks. We have experienced spiritual turbulence together, probably because of divine mercy and the flame of love. I would describe her as prayerful, kind, patient, humble, not rude, or self-seeking. She rejoices in the truth and endures the spiritual turbulence. Great traits for the person in charge of the flame of love in Memphis, Tennessee. Let me introduce Teresa Elliott. I'm going to hold the mic. My husband says I have a loud mouth, but I'm going to hold the mic anyway. I just want to make sure. My husband's always telling me, shh. So um, I am so glad to be here. And before I start, I just want everybody to take a real deep breath and know that you're not here by accident. That for many weeks, Mary and Jesus have been thinking about you and praying for you, and you're here for a reason. And it is no better place to be right now than right here, because the Holy Spirit is here. And I call on the Holy Spirit and Mary and her flame of love to be with us tonight and tomorrow and to thank her and to thank Elizabeth Kindleman, who we're going to be talking about. You know, I've read this diary uh, about two years ago, and I was just telling Jay that all of this time, I never once thought to thank Elizabeth Kindleman for all of the sufferings that she went through for us, actually. And so I just wanted to say thank you, Elizabeth, in public, um, because, uh, because she did endure so much. So I want to start with, we have two, we have me, and I'm hard to miss. I'm, I'm a loud mouth. I got a, a U in conduct when I was in the first grade. My, my first grade teacher actually taped my mouth together. Yeah, she did. Um, um, so we have two TV screens that's going to have the presentation on it, and then you have me right here. You can watch anything that you want to. Um, we don't care where you look, just as long as you're, you're hearing and the Spirit's with you. So um, I wanted to introduce Elizabeth Kindleman to you. Elizabeth Kindleman wrote this spiritual diary, um, and it's called The Flame of Love of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Spiritual Diary of Elizabeth Kindleman. It's a long name. 
And Elizabeth was born in 1913. And if you can think about the things that were going on from 1913 to her younger years, it was a very difficult time in Budapest, Hungary. Very communistic and extremely oppressive regime. And uh, it was really hard. Elizabeth was the youngest of 13 children. The other 12 children were twins. Can you imagine having six sets of twins? So, um, but even more amazing than that is that all 12 of her siblings and her parents died. And um, I don't remember the second reason, but the first reason was because of the Spanish flu. So Elizabeth was orphaned. Um, at the age of 13, I believe. And so she had a really rough life. Um, she didn't have a lot to look forward. She never had an um, education past like the fourth grade. So she felt like she wasn't worthy. She felt like she didn't really know much. She was very, very, very humble and very, very sweet. Um, at 11, she became that orphan, and that was one of the reasons why she was only able to attend those four years. At 15, she wanted to be a nun. She desperately wanted to be a nun, and she tried. She went to a couple of places, and they all rejected her. Eventually, she went, um, and the, one of um, the perpetual adoration order that she went to, there was a provincial sister there, and she took her hands, and she said, I don't know. We're going to pray, and I'll let you know. So she, she went to pray, and when she came out, she said to her, there's another mission for you. I'm sorry, but, but this is not it for you. And Elizabeth was literally crushed. She was so crushed, and she had no idea what was in front of her. Um, she eventually met her husband. He was a um, choir director and a cantor and a, uh, and a bass, and she was a, a soprano in the choir, and that's where she met him. She met him, and she, she married at 17, and she had six children. Um, she was a lay Carmelite. Um, unfortunately, he was um, some 20 years her senior, so he died, and she was left with her six kids to feed them in this very difficult time, she had multiple jobs. She had a very rough life. She talked to her spiritual director about literally having to search the garbage sometimes for her kids. And so she really had it difficult in those days. And in 1961, at the age of 48, she starts her diary. And this is how she starts. The Lord is leading us through ways that never end. We alone deviate from them. I, too, have gone astray. I was a widow with many worries and exhausting work, and it destroyed my spiritual life. She thought she didn't have much of a spiritual life. She was so beaten down, and she really didn't know what the next thing was going to be for her. Um, she felt guilty. She didn't want to go to Mass. Her kids were, she kind of went a couple of times because her kids encouraged her to. <coughs> Excuse me. And... So she was really, you just have to imagine, she was just very, very beaten down. After three years of spiritual dryness, she attended the funeral of a fellow brother Carmelite, and she was really close to him, and she remembered at the funeral some words that he had said to her. He told her, go and prostrate before her. <coughs> Excuse me. He told her when she was really down, go pray, go prostrate before her. She will take care of you. And so after this three years of spiritual dryness, she did just that. She wept under the statue of the Lady of Lords, which is interesting that we have her here to venerate. And she prayed fervently from the bottom of her heart. She'd been through all of this with her kids, all the spiritual dryness. And she said, Lord, I have had enough. Mary, help me. And the supernatural intervention of God, what happened to her after that was she began to have a dialogue, first with Jesus and then with Mary. And it was a wonderful, tremendous grace. Um, throughout this entire diary, the sweetness between Mary and all of us and between Jesus and all of us and interestingly enough, one of the things that really got to me is the sweetness between Mary and Jesus that you get to see in this dialogue. And so 
It, this, these, these dialogues or locution started with her in 1961, which is a memorable year. It's the year I was born. <laughs> Jesus told her to write it down. She didn't want to write it down. She was very self-conscious. She didn't write well. She wasn't educated. Um, <coughs> but Jesus said, write it down. So she did. So first of all, before I get into the actual diary itself, I want to tell you the succession of how this was approved by the church. Because one thing that's wonderful about our church is that our church has authority. And they investigate every single um, uh, apparition or anything. And that's exactly what happened. So in October 22nd of 1996, the Vatican wrote to Cardinal Bernadine Ruiz, I encourage you to continue so this association bears fruit among its members. And then in 19, uh, and sorry, in 2009, on June the 6th, Cardinal Peter Erdo, who was the Archbishop of Budapest, where Elizabeth was from, and he was the president of the Council of Episcopal Conferences of Europe, he bestowed an imprimatur to the diary itself and fully approved the Flame of Love movement for his archdiocese, and that's where the movement originated. <coughs> I'm so sorry. This is the turbulence that Jay was talking about. Um, I've had all kinds of things happen to me this week. Very, very strange. Um, so, interestingly enough, today, the international movement, the head of it is actually Elizabeth's grandson, which is, which is really pretty cool. Then on December the 6th in 2012, Archbishop Charles Chaput, who is the Archdiocese of Philadelphia here in the U.S., he bestows the imprimatur to the English version of the diary. So the diary was translated into Spanish and then into um, French and English. And then, um, and, and now it's, it, I have something later on in here, um, another line, but it's, 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 all, it's all over the world. So in, on June the 19th in 2013, Archbishop Buccia, Buccio, I don't know how to pronounce that correctly, he was the secretary of the state office at the Vatican, and from the Vatican, he said, he conveyed His Holiness Pope Francis, invoking the protection of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, is pleased to impart his apostolic blessing, which he extends to this movement, the flame of love of the Immaculate Heart. So in 2013, um, Pope Francis blessed the movement, which is, which is wonderful. And, and so it's not been that long from now. I mean, th think about that that's not been long. And so that's why we are very new at spreading um, this message and this, and this flame of love. The flame of love first went from Hungary to Ecuador, which is strange, but in Budapest there was a missionary that was from Ecuador, that, that um, Archbishop uh, Ruiz, and he, he's the one that brought it to Ecuador. And then next it went to Mexico, and then it went to all of South America, then it went to Canada and the United States, and in the United States, the headquarters is Philadelphia. And then it went to many others, including Africa. And so now it's still spreading, although it's new. And if you think about how long it took St. Faustina's message to spread, um, it's amazing that it spread as much as it has since 2013. These heavenly communications that happened between Jesus and Mary, they, they're recognized by the Holy Catholic Church, and they perfectly support and they specifically amplify the urgency of the message of Fatima. I once had somebody ask me, well, what's the difference between this and that? And I get so confused with all these ap apparitions. And I go back to our reading from a couple of weeks ago. Is Jesus divided? Is Mary divided? Absolutely not. Every, every place, the flame of love is literally the culmination of all of the promises and the apparitions that Mary has been making for all of these years. We're, we're coming to the end times. I don't think that there's any one of you that don't realize that we are coming to the end times. It, 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 it's just very obvious um, looking at the world and where we are. In June 19th of 2013, um, after the um, Archbishop Angela Buccia um, conveyed his, his, um, his blessing, after that, um, things started moving very, very fast. And that's what makes, 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 that is what brings us to where we are here. Um, Elizabeth Kindleman wrote a complete spiritual diary. It's, it's 300 or so pages. It's some of the most beautiful poetry 
and um, amazing uh, things in a book I've ever read in my life. The Flame of Love of the Immaculate Heart of Mary was written at the request of our Lord Jesus and it was written between the years of 1961 and 1982. Elizabeth died in 1985, so she spent all of those years um, really slaving um, after this diary. Jesus said to Elizabeth, I have been waiting for you a long time. Wouldn't every one of you like for somebody to say that to you? <laughs> I mean, I just think that's pretty awesome. Um, I just like, I wish somebody would say that, and it's just really wonderful. He said to her, look at my disfigured face and my tortured sacred body. Didn't I suffer to save souls? Believe in me and adore me. At that very moment, Elizabeth said, I made acts of faith, hope, and charity, and I begged him to never allow that I be separated from him. I asked him to chain me to his sacred feet so that I would always be united with him. Jesus said, I want to give you great graces, but you must renounce yourself completely. Now, this is really what's amazing to me about Elizabeth. If you think about Peter, when Jesus said he was going to go and die and be put to death on the cross, what did Peter do? Peter was very upset. No, you won't. I will die for you. I will protect you. And then we all know what happened. He denied him. And so we had a lot of pride. This is what is really amazing to me about Elizabeth. When Jesus asked her that and said, I want you to renounce yourself completely, Elizabeth said, am I capable of doing that? <laughs> so she's basically saying, I don't think I can, Jesus. What do you think? You know, um, so she was so very humble. Jesus said, and it's something that every one of us need to think about these words, you must only will it and you leave the rest up to me. So when you're wanting something, when you're praying something, when you are um, wanting to renounce yourself or you're wanting to do something special to him, you remember those words. You must only will it. Um, just absolutely beautiful. So what did renouncing yourself mean to Elizabeth? What it meant was so that nothing would tie me to this world, I gave away everything to my children. So after that horrible, very difficult um, life that she had as an orphan and then trying to take care of her children and then having two or three jobs at a time and just going out and begging for the garbage when she needed to and working in the plastic factory and just trying to get her life together, she ended up having a decent life with her husband. She had a four bedroom house and she had, by that time, he had uh, gotten her a four bedroom house and she had nice amenities. So for Jesus to tell her to renounce herself, this was a, a big deal. She was gonna have to give up a lot. And um, what she did, she had this um, urge and she, she wanted to do what he said. So what renouncing yourself meant to Elizabeth was she gave the house ownership to one of her daughters that was living with her and her husband and child, her daughter, husband and children were living with her. So she gave the house to her daughter. She told her daughter that she would no longer cook, that her daughter would do the cooking and that she would eat whatever her daughter gave her. Then she quit her job and she stayed at home to watch the two small children so that her daughter could work. Now this is a pretty huge change for her. Um, Jesus told, tells her otherwise in the diary, um, you're a little bit worldly, Elizabeth. I need you to focus. I need you to focus on me. And this is what she, this is what she did in order to, um, to comply with what he asked her to do. So what is the flame of love purpose? It is two things. And if there is nothing you remember from tonight, please remember these two things. It's in the diary. And uh, the first is... Um, the purpose of the flame of love. It's also what distinguishes this devotion from many others. And that is the one purpose is blinding Satan. How many of you have that ability? Mm, certain don't. How many of you have felt the effects of turbulence in your own life and obstacles? Blinding Satan is mentioned in the diary 36 times. 
It's pretty amazing. And the second purpose of the flame of love is saving souls. Now this is not different than any of the other messages that have come from Fatima and St. Faustina and by Mercy and all of that. It's blinding Satan to save souls. Now this blinding Satan is not any magic hocus pocus. It's not, I'm going to like the love potions as you see in the movie. It's not like I'm going to go, poop, you're, you're there and you're going to love me and it's going to be perfect. The purpose of this, these prayers that Jesus and Mary gave her were to blind Satan and the purpose of them is that when you say them, what you're doing is Mary asked for this grace from the Trinity. And when you say them, what happens is it blinds Satan so that the obstacles for, the, for what you're praying for are taken away. Now that in and of itself doesn't necessarily make a person, you know, love Jesus, does it? Or come to him. But many, many times in this diary, Mary and Jesus are so upset and Mary sobs and sobs that one point Elizabeth was trying to hear her. She was, Mary was sobbing and crying so hard she could hardly hear what she was saying. And it just, it just tells you the, the immense love and um, how, how badly she wants for people to know that she wants them to be with her son. Her whole entire life, her whole entire job is to pick you up and give you a hug and turn you around 360 degrees and point you to her son. And she wants to do that so badly. And she was telling this to Elizabeth and Elizabeth was hearing it and she's like, well, who am I? I'm just a nobody. And she said, I chose you because you have a mother's heart. And it's just a, a beautiful, beautiful story. So the blinding of Satan isn't a magic hocus pocus. But when, when, when that um, blinding of Satan happens, it basically takes away whatever obstacle that's been put in front of a person so that they can see and hear the truth for themselves. Because just like Jesus said, all you have to do is will it. And the one thing that we don't have, we don't have a lot of choices in our life. We don't know what our next step's going to be. We think we have control, but we absolutely do not. But the one thing, the only thing that we have control over is our choice. And that's the only thing that Jesus wants from you. And that's the only thing that he wanted from, from all of us from the beginning. And so that's, what the, the, that's the reason why Mary went to the Trinity and asked them for this. She asked them for this, and this grace is called a signal grace. And a signal grace is a grace that's given at a very specific point in time for a very specific purpose. Uh, the Pentecost would have been considered a signal grace. It was very specific for that point in time. This one is very specific for right now. So think about that. This is not somebody in a Bible, in a book, inactive. This is... Jesus and Mary active right now in our life trying to get our attention and Mary has gotten this grace for us and it is our job to tell other people. And what, this is what Mary said to her. Uh, I would like to place in your hands a new instrument. It is the flame of love of my heart. With this flame full of graces that I give you from my heart, ignite all the hearts in the entire country. Let this flame go from heart to heart. Now think about this. I want you to remember this. This is how the flame spreads. This isn't a media thing. It's not the way the world does it. We're not going to the Vatican and jumping up and down. This is heart to heart. This is you and me and the next people that you're next and the person that you're next to tomorrow. This is the miracle becoming the blaze whose dazzling light will blind Satan. This is the fire of love of union. What union? It's the fire of the union between Jesus and his Father and his Holy Spirit and Mary and their union, all of their union with us. It's that fire. And he wants us to be with him in eternity. And he sees us just wandering. And in these end times, it's very difficult. I listened to a talk not that long ago by Father Ribbinger. I don't know if, how many of you have ever heard of him. 
or heard his talks, but he's an exorcist. And one of the things that he was saying was that um, exorcisms work, of course. They always, they always have and they always will. But he said, one thing that I will tell you, it takes longer. He said, it takes longer today than it used to. Um, and it's just the times that we're in. Um, this is that fire of love of union which I obtained from the Heavenly Father through the merits of the wounds of my Divine Son. So Mary obtained this because of the merit of the wounds of Jesus. So Mary tells Elizabeth, we will put out fire with fire, the fire of hatred with the fire of love. So the gift of the grace that the Blessed Virgin offers us is this. Mary says to her, I assure you, my little one, that I have never before given into your hands such a powerful force of grace, the burning flame of the love of my heart. Ever since the Word became flesh, I have not undertaken a greater movement than this flame of love of my heart. It rushes to you. Until now, nothing else could blind Satan as much. And it is up to you not to reject it. For if you reject it, it will simply spell disaster. So Jesus said, No soul that I have entrusted to care for my priest ought to be damned. He's telling this to Elizabeth. This word, damnation, causes terrible pain in my heart. So he's expressing to Elizabeth how much pain he's feeling. You know, I don't know why, but... I always thought Mary and Jesus were up there together, and I didn't think he was still experiencing pain. But he's still experiencing pain. He's still experiencing a lot of pain because he wants us so desperately. I would suffer death on the cross again for each soul, even suffering a thousand times more since there is no hope for the damned. Prevent this with your burning desires. Save souls. Do you really know what desire is, Jesus said? It is a marvelous and a delicate instrument that even the most helpless man can use as a miraculous instrument to save souls. The key point is he should unite his desire with my precious blood that exudes from my side. Now that's divine mercy right there. Increase your desire with all of your might. All of your might to save as many souls as possible. When he was expressing that loss to Elizabeth, it was extremely painful for him. The sweet Savior allowed me, Elizabeth, to share his pain in my heart. Because the pain was so sharp, I almost collapsed. Oh Lord Jesus, I will make every effort that the souls entrusted to me are not damned, and those souls are us. Those souls were all the souls of Hungary. So Jesus gave Elizabeth the unity prayer. And at first reading the unity prayer, which we prayed at the very beginning, you would think that it is a beautiful love story and desire for an intimate relationship between Jesus and us. And it is. It is exactly that. But it's more than that. Because if you think about the prayers that Jesus said in Gethsemane when he was praying to the Father... He was about to die, and he was praying for us. He was praying for the, for the union between him and us. So this prayer is not just a love story of an intimate relationship and desire he wants to have with us. This is a desire for us to have an intimate relationship with each other and him. He wants us to all be unified. That's the reason why he wants this collaboration. Do you think... Jesus needs us for him to save souls. He wants us. He wants to do it together. So this is the unity prayer. If you guys still have it, you can, you can see it as I read it. Um, then and Elizabeth said, Then the sweet Redeemer, he asked me to pray with him the prayer that expresses his deepest desires. So this prayer was given from Jesus to Elizabeth to tell her his deepest desires. May our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat to the same rhythm. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be in unison. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances melt in one another. 
and may our lips beg our Heavenly Father together to gain mercy. Now, the first time I read this prayer and I started, tried to pray it, I remember the very first time I read this prayer and I was in a room with a picture of Jesus in it. And I tried real hard to look at the picture of Jesus while I was saying that line. I couldn't look at him. I just couldn't. I tried. I was like, I love you and I want to look at you. And of course, I know that's not him. That's just a symbol, but that's okay. We have a lot of symbols. I have things that kind of look like my kids in a little thing on my chest, you know, around my necklace, but it's just a symbol of them. But I was trying to look at it and I couldn't really... I just didn't feel like I was ready yet. Uh, I, I just can't, can't explain that, but it's so intimate. So, so the thing to think about this is, this is how badly Jesus wants an intimate relationship with us. He just doesn't want the peripheral meet and greet. As a matter of fact, one time he chastised Elizabeth after she went to church. And when uh, Elizabeth left church, she said goodbye to all of her friends and she walked out. And as she was walking home, Jesus said to her, you kind of hurt my feelings. You, you said goodbye to everybody, but you didn't say goodbye to me. And I will never leave a church the same way since. I read that and I thought about it. And now whenever I'm leaving church, I try, the very last thing I do is to look at that tabernacle and to say thank you. He just, he, that's just his desire to have that intimate relationship with us. So Elizabeth said, I made this prayer completely mine the Lord meditated on it many times with me, and he asserted that these are his eternal longings. He taught me this prayer so that I would in turn teach it to others. With all of our strength in mind, let us make this our own, his eternal thoughts and burning desires. So afterwards, Jesus said, this prayer is an instrument in your hands. By collaborating with me, Satan will be blinded by it. And because of his blindness, souls will not be led into sin. So Jesus says it, and Mary says it, and they say it again and again, and they keep pleading with her to help them save souls. Um, then Elizabeth said, I'm going to record what the Blessed Virgin told me this year, in 1962, I kept it inside for a long time without daring to write it down. It was the petition that the Blessed Virgin gave me. Mary said, when you say the prayer that honors me, the Hail Mary, include this petition in the following Mary, in the following manner. Hail Mary, full of grace, and when you get to pray for us sinners, say, spread the effect of grace of thy flame of love over all of humanity now and at the hour of our death. Amen. So we have the prayer from Jesus. We have this additional petition from, from Mary. Elizabeth further writes in her diary that the competent bishop that she went to see asked her why, why the very old Hail Mary has to be recited differently. On February 2nd, 1982, the Lord answered her because Elizabeth asked him. Jesus said, it is exclusively thanks to the efficacious pleas of the Most Holy Virgin that the Most Holy Trinity granted this effusion of the flame of love. By it, ask in the prayer with which you greet me the mo in which you greet most my Holy Mother. Spread the effect. So Jesus repeats it to her. Spread the effect of the flame of love over all of humanity. So that by its effect, humanity is converted. That's the purpose of it. Mary said, I do not want to change the prayer by which you honor me by this petition. I want to shake humanity. Kind of like Jesus saying, just because I'm here and it's the New Testament doesn't mean that the Old Testament isn't valid. Mary said, I want to shake humanity. This is not a new prayer formula. It just must be a constant supplication. So this is how the Blessed Mary ex describes the flame of love. And it's, it's very difficult because when you're so into that diary, you want to read it, the whole thing, to everybody because it's so beautiful. But this is, um, this is when the Virgin Mary is explaining this flame of love to Elizabeth. And she says, My little one, my flame of love has become so incandescent that I want to spread it on you, not only its light, but also its warmth with all of its power. My flame of love is so great that I can no longer keep it within me. It leaps out at you with an explosive force. 
My love that is spreading will overcome the satanic hatred saved from damnation. I am confirming there has never been anything like it before. This is my greatest miracle ever that I am accomplishing for all. She begged me not to misunderstand her. My words are very clear and they're easy to understand. Hence, do not create confusion with misinterpretations. Your responsibility then would be great if you ever did this. Get to work. Do not be lazy. I will help you in, an effort, in the most miraculous way and my help will always continue. Trust me. Act quickly. Do not put off my cause to another day. This is interesting, so I'm going to tell you this. I wrestled with um, Spellcheck. Spellcheck wanted me to capitalize Satan, and I refused. Um, so when you see it, <laughs> know that it took about ten times. <laughs> yes, so, so. Uh, so Mary said, Satan does not look on with arms folded. He is making enormous efforts. He already feels that my flame of love is lighting. <coughs> This provoked his terrible fury. So Satan is not happy. Enter into battle, Elizabeth. We will be the conquerors. My flame of love will blind Satan to the same extent that all of you spread it around the world. Just as the whole world knows my name, so I want the flame of love of my heart performing miracles in the depths of hearts to also be known. There will be no need to investigate this miracle. All will feel its authenticity within their own hearts. Whoever has felt it once will communicate it to others because my grace will be active in them. There is no need for authentication. I will authenticate it myself in every soul so that all will recognize the effusion of grace of my flame of love. So we spread it mouth to mouth, heart to heart. We don't do anything. Mary says, you don't need to do anything. You'd say the story. I will authenticate it myself in each person's heart. One day, Jesus said, my daughter, I'm now going to specify how each day of the week should be allocated. If you remember, I began to speak about this previously. However, I put this off until today to include more things in your schedule. Come if you have time. If you have plenty of it, tell me. The decision is yours. I respect your free will completely. Doesn't that sound just like Jesus? You flatter me if you abandon it spontaneously to me. So this was when in uh, April 10th, 1962, this is when Jesus gave to Elizabeth, Elizabeth a weekly agenda. And on Monday, he wanted her to pray for holy souls. He said, May um, the day of the holy souls on Monday, let your actions be done with the purpose of helping them. In union with me, desire that these souls contemplate my face as early as possible. Offer for them a strict fast as well as prayers during the period of night. A strict fast meant uh, bread and water for the day up until 6 p.m. Now this was not meant, and it, it said later, later on, this is not meant for people with medication, this is not meant for people that have diabetes and can't do it. The purpose of this was some kind of sacrifice. And what the flame of love isn't, it's not something that Mary and Jesus are asking us to hurt ourselves in any way, shape, or form. What they want is our heart. And the best way to show your heart to somebody is to sacrifice for them. So he was, So the, 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 the point is, if you really wanted to do this agenda, like Elizabeth did, and you had a, a diet, dietary issue, you could choose something else. I had an interesting conversation with a friend that I work at work. By the way, I've had the opportunity to, to tell this story to four people that were Baptist, Presbyterian, and Episcopal, and I was absolutely amazed that they were on every single word of my mouth and immediately wanted the diary. Um, and so there's nothing in that that came from me, I can tell you. It did come from Mary. But um, 
it's just amazing how, how, how that works. So, um, but while I was telling a friend at work about this, um, I said, for instance, if all you wanted to do, if, if you thought all that you could do was say, maybe give up your coffee in the morning. <laughs> this man said, there is no way I'm giving up my coffee. He says, I won't eat for 12 hours before I'll give up my coffee. So, you know, everybody has their thing. And um, Christine has a very sweet story about her fast um, that I don't repeat, which I, I, that really endeared me. But that was the point. It's, it's a fast. So, if your child comes to you and they say, I love you, Mom, and they keep walking and they go down two streets, does that mean that they love you? Probably. But if your child walks up and it's after dinner and they begin picking up and start doing all of the dishes and wanting to make sure that they're done as soon as possible, was that an act of sacrifice? Did they say, I love you? That's really all this is. It's an act of sacrifice. It's a way to say, I love you and I hear you. So what um, he said is, anyone fasting on bread and water on Monday will free each time the soul of a priest from the place of suffering. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Um, Whoever practices this will receive the grace of being liberated from the place of suffering within eight days after their death. Our mother herself is asking for this. Her appeal to her flame of love obliges me to fulfill her request. So that is um, just, just so sweet. On Tuesday, make a spiritual communion for each member of your family. I usually do it while I'm doing the rosary. Usually each decade or each bead is for each person in, in my family. Offer each person one by one to our dear mother. She will take them under her protection. You will also offer that evening an evening vigil for them. And I wonder the first time I read this evening, why evening? You know, that, that's kind of hard right there. I'm going to tell you in a minute why evening. My daughter, you must be responsible for your family leading them to me, each in his own particular way. Now listen to those words, because Jesus said that. Each in his own particular way. That's, that's, that part is pretty amazing. Ask for my graces on their behalf unceasingly. We will work together, and I cannot do it without your support. Your most worthy patron is St. Joseph. Do not forget him. Invoke him every day. He will gladly help making our cause a success. So the first time I decided I was going to try this weekly agenda and I was going to fast, um, I was like, I, I was like, all right, St. Joseph, Jesus said, invoke you. You've got to help me here. I really want that biscuit. <laughs> right there. And it wasn't necessarily all that hard if I had a regular routine. You know, we all get up, we have a regular routine. You get up, you go, you know, you go to the bathroom, you do your thing, you, know, you go to work or do whatever, and you whatever. But when you're not in your routine, especially when there's food placed right in front of you, that's kind of difficult. And so there's this, um, um, I'm on this um, uh, group at church, and every time they meet, they meet on Mondays. <laughs> And there's always wonderful food there. And so I told him, I said, DRC, can we meet some other day? <laughs> that was not that possible. But anyway, um, what, I guess what I'm about to tell you is I didn't think I could do it. Um, and I know the reason I can is because I did just what she told me. I invoked St. Joseph. But um, the point is, it, it's not that specific thing. The whole point there is a sacrifice, some kind of sacrifice from you, from your own heart. On Wednesday is a day for priestly vocations. Ask me for many young men with a fervent heart. You will get as many as requested because the desire lies in the soul of many young men. So Jesus is telling her the desire is in the soul of many young men. They need your help. So it's not like they're, they're out there and they're just not there. They're out there and they're living in their own heads. And they need our help because the one thing that's amazing about Jesus and Mary, when you belong to them, you belong to everybody else that belongs to them. And so he's basically begging you to help his, his, his priests. Um, do not be overwhelmed. Through the prayers of the night vigil, you can obtain abundant graces for them. Then on Thursday, reparation to the Blessed Sacrament on that day. You will spend hours in the, in the sacred presence. Adore me with great fervor for making reparation for the many offenses inflicted on me. And then on Thursday back then, he asked uh, Elizabeth to offer a strict fast for then on, for 12 priests. So at that particular time, they were trying to get the word out. And Jesus and Mary told her 
they were starting with 12 priests. And so all, all these extra sacrifices that happened on Thursday and Friday were specifically to get this uh, flame into those 12 priests because uh, Mary said they, they are the ones that have been chosen and they will spread it from there. So Elizabeth went through many sacrifices for that purpose in all of her prayers. She said, I went to the limit and I tell you, you cannot go to excess in doing something for me. On Friday, with all of the love of your heart, immerse yourself in my sorrowful passion. So, of course, this fits perfectly in with uh, the, the um, Divine Mercy and St. Faustina. When you arise in the morning, recall what it was awaiting me the entire day after the terrible torments of that night. While at work, contemplate the way of the cross and consider that I did not have any moment at rest. Totally exhausted, I was forced to climb the Mount of Calvary. There was much to contemplate. I went to the limit. And I tell you, you cannot go to excess in doing something for me. From noon until three, adore my sacred wounds. Hopefully you can keep the fast until the time my sacred body was taken down from the cross. Then on that day, offer the night prayer for the twelve priests. You... If you accept to sacrifice yourself, my daughter, you will receive an even greater abundance of graces. So this was not easy for her. And all of these 12 um, priests, if you can imagine, um, they, a lot of them, as a matter of fact, probably all of them didn't even know her. And imagine her going through all of this for complete strangers that she didn't, you know, she didn't even know. Then on Saturday, Jesus asked her to vener venerate our mother in a special way with a very particular tenderness. As you are well aware, she is the mother of all graces. Wish that she be venerated on earth as she is venerated in heaven by the multitude of angels and saints. Seek for agonizing priests the grace of a holy death. Offer every moment of the day for that purpose. What a great reward you will receive. In heaven, priestly souls will intercede for you, and the most holy virgin will be waiting for your soul at the hour of your death. Offer the night vigil for this intention also. So the first time I decided I would try to stumble through the weekly agenda, I thought, well, how do you venerate Mary on Saturday? And I was trying, I was trying to think about it. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll go buy her flowers. So I, I went and I put her little statue on my little windowsill and I bought her some flowers. And my husband came home and he thought I had gone crazy. <laughs> and um, he was like, what's that for? I was like, it's for Mary. And he really looked at me strange. Like, okay, all right. That, the first time. He does it. Now he walks in the door and he doesn't even. He's like, oh, okay. You know, it's there. So um, on Sunday, for this day, the lovable Redeemer gives no specific directions. Of course, it's the day of rest, right? So then back to the question. Why, what was so special about the prayers at night? And this is something else that just really, really touched me. On... August the 1st, 1962, at 3 a.m. in the morning, a lot of these um, prayers and a lot of these messages came at 3 a.m. in the morning. The Lord awakened me by his presence and his words. Jesus said, and I know all you're going to recognize this, think about the middle of the night for your own self. Jesus said, in the loneliness of the night, I seek hearts. Then he left me. After he departed, I wondered about the intention for which I would offer this night's prayer. I saw clearly that I should offer it to the flame of love of the Virgin so that it would be ignited. As soon as I made this intention, the devil's presence filled me with anguish. O oh, Heavenly Mother, I'm praying for this with all of my strength and all of my longings, but I am nobody. What can I do? So... In the, in the middle of the night, that's the reason why the prayers are so special because he wants us, because he knows a lot of us have anguish in the middle of the night. And he wants, that's when he wants us to be comforted. And that's when he wants to draw us to him a lot. So while I was immersed in the flame of love, I realized to my surprise that the anguish caused the devil's presence, the anguish that the devil's presence had caused had disappeared. It had left imperceptibly I felt as if a blind man had left my side. I was very surprised. My soul felt so light, like nothing I had ever felt in my life. When this happened, I felt as if my body had been left behind, leaving only my soul. 
I was knocked to my knees completely astonished. I felt that my soul was like covered rags, crudely sewn, such as the beggars wear. I was overwhelmed by a very depressing sensation. And this part of the diary really, um, really, really touched me of the tenderness between Mary and her son Jesus. Because the next words after that, this happened and she felt that depression, and she was seeing her own soul and she was seeing it covered in rags and tattered and, you know, I, you, how can you accept me? How can you like me? I'm just here. And she was telling this to Mary and Mary said, uh, I'm sorry, Elizabeth said, you see my Jesus how I am. Look at me. I, I got nothing. When I said this in a pleading voice, the Blessed Virgin covered my sorrowful rags with her mantle, her scapular, and she said to me, my little one, there are many souls like this in my country. But together with you, I cover them with my motherly mantle, and I hide their mendicant soul from the eyes of my divine son so that he will not be sad because of all of you. So I think about the fact, how many times do you, do you hear or do you say, or somebody says, I don't, you know, I'm not, I, I don't get it, I don't know he says anything, and I don't, I don't hear Jesus, or I don't want to you know, do that, or I don't really understand that, or I don't, I just don't really get it. And then it dawned on me when I read this, I'm complaining that I don't have a relationship with Jesus, and my own sin is the thing that pushed him away. That's what, when I read that, it just really, and in my pushing him away, Mary is covering me so that he doesn't see it and it doesn't hurt him because Mary wants the best for us. It's just extremely touching. Um, that's one of the reasons this diary is just so amazing. It's because of that love that you see between them. So why is this grace such urgency? Satan has been attacking families with laser-like focus. This is not a surprise to any of you, I'm sure. Because he knows that the future of the world lies in the family. Sister Lucia de Santos of Fatima prophesied to humanity that the final battle would be between the Lord and the reign of Satan, and it would be brought about by marriage and the family. Those days are upon us right now, and they have been for quite some time. As much as Satan is attacking the unity of the family, our enemy also mercilessly attacks our faith and our one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We've been beaten up pretty bad, haven't we? The flame of love grace is a signal grace which Mary obtained for us from the Trinity for us right now in this time. The other thing on Thursdays and Fridays is that Mary promised that she would consider those great days of graces and she said, offer reparation to my divine son on those days and you will receive a great grace. During the hours of reparation, the power of Satan will weaken to the degree that those that are making reparations praise for sinners. The harder you pray that day, the more effect it's going to have. Whenever someone does adoration in a spirit of atonement or visits the blessed sacrament, as long as they're there in that last, Satan loses his dominion on the pair of souls. Blinded, he ceases to reign on souls. If you attend Mass with un without being under obligation to do so, sacrifice, different, and you are in a state of grace before God, during that time I will pour out the flame of love of my heart and blind Satan. My graces will flow abundantly to the souls for whom you offer the Holy Mass. The participation in the Holy Mass is what helps the most to blind Satan. So when you're not wanting to go to Mass, think about that. When priests observe the Monday fast in all the Holy Masses that they celebrate that week, at the moment of consecration, they will free an innumerable number of souls from purgatory. Later, Elizabeth asks him, what do you mean by innumerable? And he basically tells her, far too many than you could possibly fathom. When those persons consecrated to God and the faithful keep the Monday fast, they will free a multitude of souls. So we get to free a multitude of souls. Priests get to, to free 
innumerable numbers. So, you know, priests are special and all. I haven't handed this to my priest yet. I'm going to hand it to him and I'm going to say, see the responsibility that you have? <laughs> my little one, your compassion for the poor souls has so moved my motherly heart that I grant the grace that you sought. If at any moment while invoking my flame of love, any of you pray in my honor three Hail Marys, a soul is released from purgatory. Hence the reason we started these prayers with three Hail Marys. During November, the month of the deceased, ten souls will be released from purgatory. You know how many decades of Hail Marys you sing in a rosary? Think of that times ten. It's a bunch. For each Hail Mary that's recited, the suffering souls must also feel the effect of grace of the flame of love of my maternal heart. For those families observing the holy hour of reparation on Thursday or Friday, so there's a hold. So if you pray together as a family, and Mary asks to be two or more, she wants you to be together as a family. And she says, if you pray during that time, if, something, if someone happens to die in the family, the deceased is freed from purgatory after a single day of strict fasting observed by any member of the family, any single member of the family. And then um, in parentheses, let us understand if he died in a state of grace. My little one, I extend the effect of the grace of the flame of love of my heart over all people and all nations. Not only those living in the Mo Holy Mother Church, but over all of the souls that are marked with the sign of the blessed cross of my divine son also over those who are not baptized. So Mary specifically says, this isn't meant just for the mother church. There are other souls out there. They are marked with the blessed cross of my divine son. This is meant for them too. So that's the reason why it gave me the courage to talk to people outside of my church. And, and, um, and I really didn't think that it was going to say, I was going to say it, I really didn't think they'd accept it, and um, every one of them wanted a book, like right away. One of them, I told her I, told her I was going to get it, it was on a Friday. I told her I was going to get her a book on Monday, she bought it on Kindle on Saturday, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now this gets to the flame of love and, and consecration to Mary, um, my own personal testimony. So this is a little bit harder, because this is very personal. Um, these are the things that have happened to me. So this grace is different for every person. Everybody has got, just like Jesus said, everybody comes in a different way. One of the wonderful things that Father Otto says is he said, you know, one priest said, you know, I've been praying this and it doesn't really mean much to me. I don't get it. You know, I, I think it's okay, but it really isn't all that right. And he said, and all of a sudden I started realizing that I was praying more. And I didn't even realize I was praying more. He said, I wanted to pray. I just wanted to pray. And so that was his effect. It may not be exactly the same. But I'm telling you this right now because in six months, in three weeks, in a year, whenever, you're going to have these graces and they're going to happen to you. And Father Otto describes them perfectly as time-released capsules. And when you feel them, I want you to think back on that moment. It's not going to be the same. But I want you to think back on that moment because it's very specifically a gift from this flame of love. So these are the things that happened to me personally. The very first time that I heard the message, I felt like Mary had opened a window in my soul that I didn't even know was there. I thought I had renounced myself. I really did. I didn't realize how not humble I was until that. Um, I thought I had given myself to Jesus completely when I heard this. I didn't realize. It was almost like I had a whole room of a huge mansion and I only could see like a portion of it. And I, it, it didn't bother me because I didn't even know the rest of it existed, actually. I was perfectly fine in my own little world. But when this happened, it was like somebody opened up the door and I was shoved and pushed into his love. I can't describe it. Um, I had fresh, new, intimate love with Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and it was waiting for me on the other side of that window, and how did I get it? Just like Jesus said, I only had to will it. It has given me the grace to endure hardship with joy. It's the biggest mystery to me of, of, of God and the Trinity, is how you can feel so much pain 
and so much joy at the same time. It's just absolutely amazing. It also gave me a newer illumination of conscience. There were three profound miracles that happened to me. I'm going to tell you about two. Um, one was that my brother returned to the church after almost 10 years. My girls are sitting right there. They're a witness to me. Um, my brother had been away from the church for 10 years. I didn't think he was ever going to come back. I prayed to him. And when he came to me and he told me, I told him, I am not surprised. But when I tried to tell him this story, he wouldn't have anything to do with it. That's okay. doesn't matter. But what he doesn't know is that this thing that he rejected is the reason that gave him the grace to came back. I know it. He may never know it. doesn't matter. The second thing that happened to me, and it's extremely hard to describe, but one night in the middle of the night, I was having my night prayers. And for me, I, I, can't, I can't do like Elizabeth, and I don't think that Jesus is necessarily asking us for do like hours, hours, and hours. But I wanted to, in my way, I was like, I'm just going to start with something nice. When I get up in the middle of the night, we all get up in the middle of the night. We go to the bathroom, right? So I'm, whenever I get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom, I want to say a prayer. So this one night I did. I got up, I went to the bathroom, I said a prayer. And about a week earlier, I had been talking and I was excited because I had been praying my prayers. And I said, you know, Jesus, I've been doing this for so long. And I don't mean to complain, but I've been doing this rosary over and over and over again. And I know it's for souls that I don't know and I don't see and it shouldn't matter. But you know, in the book, you allowed Elizabeth Kindleman to feel their joy when they were released from purgatory. I said, that was so nice. I said, could I, could I get that? And then as soon as I said it, I mean literally, as soon as I said it, I retracted it. And I felt horribly guilty. And I said, I am so sorry. I didn't mean it. I know that your flame of love is with me. And I know that you're there. And I believe you. And I don't need it. So I'm really sorry. Just forget it. And I, and I didn't think anything about it. And a week later, I got up in the middle of the night. I went to say my prayers as I was going to the bathroom. And I came back, and I was kind of settling back in. I thought, well, I'll just say one more Hail Mary. And I was absolutely overwhelmed. And this, it, was, it was as if somebody had possessed my body. And it was my mother. My mother's been dead for quite some time. And I felt my mother, and it's... It was as if every single piece of love she ever had for me or I ever had for her, it was like I was feeling all of it in one minute, just like that. And it was so overwhelming that I thought I was going to die. I mean, this only lasted about seven seconds. But it was so overwhelming to me that I really thought, I'm, I'm, I'm about to stop breathing, Jesus. You know, it's like, you know, this is what happened. I'm about to stop breathing. And... And then it was gone, and I just said, thank you so much. And as soon as I said thank you, he said to me, you just released your mother from purgatory. And I didn't, I, 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 I will never be able to express that, that joy. Um, and it was over. And so I tell you that everybody's grace is not the same. Everybody's walk is not the same. But I do tell you that this intimate relationship that he wants with each one of you is real. And Jesus and Mary are here right now in our times, and they want to be active, and they want you to be active with them.